we are recording now. Okay, so you guys are done with your exam one. We're gonna have to, we are gonna try to get your scores uh, to you Monday of next week. And then you'll have a couple of days for uh, regrade requests by email. And then we are off for the summer break. Before we do that, I want to wrap up the conversation of Fourier series as much as possible. After we come back from the, from the break, we can get into Fourier transform. So Fourier series, we started talking about the motivation first, right? What was the motivation for Fourier series? I have a continuous periodic signal. I want to find out what all frequencies make up that signal. So I want to do two things. One, represent a continuous time signal, which is periodic, as a summation of a bunch of sinusoids. And those sinusoids are going to have frequencies. What frequencies? Omega naught, plus and minus omega naught, plus and minus two omega naught, plus and minus three omega naught, and so on. And I call them what? Fundamental, second harmonic, third harmonic, and so on. By summing up, and each sinusoid is going to have a different amplitude. And that specific amplitude, we are calling that the Fourier series coefficient. So you will have a Fourier series coefficient when k is zero, the DC term, a sub zero. You will have a Fourier series coefficient for the first harmonic, a1 and a minus one. The subscript is telling you which harmonic. And then you will have a2 and so on and so on, right? So a sub k, those are your exponential Fourier series coefficients. That's what we are trying to figure out. Now to do that, we went through, we went through these slides already but I'm going to give you guys a quick refresher on this. This was the exponential Fourier series. Can anybody tell me why did we pick e to the j k omega naught t? Why didn't we pick a triangle? Why didn't, go ahead. Orthogonal, key, right? First we proved that a set of complex exponentials make up an orthogonal set. We also proved that you can take any signal and project it onto an orthogonal set, and that's it. It will be completely represented by all those projections. So that's why our exponential, complex exponential orthogonal set works for this. So this is, these are your orthogonal functions where k is changing. A k is representing the Fourier series coefficients. And when you project this x of t onto each of those complex exponentials, each projection, when you sum them back up, you will get back your x of t. Now, if I go from negative infinity to infinity, include all the projections, then I get equal, right? Over here, I'm using an equal sign because I'm able to completely capture that x of t in those projections. However, if I limited those projections to say, first six harmonics, first 10 harmonics, first 100 harmonics, then it would be an approximation. It would not be an equal to sign. Next, uh, we said periodic. We said the condition is x of t should be equal to x of t plus cap t, where cap t is the time period. So minimum time, cap t, that satisfies that relationship is going to be called our time period of that signal. We looked at Euler's identity. You guys have seen this from long time ago, right? E to the jx, when do you see Euler's identity first? Calculus, okay. So you have seen this before, E to the jx. In our case, x is going to be conveniently chosen as omega naught t, where omega naught is your, uh, by the way, quick question. How many people call this a w? Can do that, can do that. All right, so <laughs> can do that. Call it omega naught. Yes, agreed. Everybody is going to call that omega naught. If anybody calls that W, it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt. Pretty. <laughs> what was that? Here. <laughs> Who taught you signals and systems? Hamid did. What is this W that there goes my, there goes my entire career. <laughs> Call it Omega, all right. 
So e to the plus or minus j omega, the reason why this is funny is because I've, uh, you know, heard that many times in office hours, and I just fall off my chair when I do that. So um, don't do it, please. E to the plus or minus j omega naught t can be repre represented using a cosine and a sine. So you've got cosine omega naught t plus or minus the imaginary part is j sine omega naught t. Where omega naught again is the radiant frequency of this cosine or sine. Now when you sketch it out, the cosine for one time period looks like this. And then if you did that for the sine, it would look something like that, right? For one time period. But the key is if you integrated over one time period over this cosine or the sine, your area would go to zero. Right? The positive part would cancel out the negative part. Same would apply for cosine as shown or sine, which is not shown. So mathematically, you would write it as integration of cosine for one time period will go to zero. Integration of sine over one time period will go to zero, which means that the integration of this complex exponential over one time period will equal zero. Now we agreed on this before, right? Like last time we met for a lecture, we agreed on that. Now let's try to find out the magnitude of A2. A2 is belonging to the set of Fourier series coefficients. Now we are specifically calling them exponential Fourier series coefficients. Later on, we'll have trig Fourier series coefficients. Quick note about that. If you hear Fourier series coefficients, they're talking about exponential ones. If we talk about trig Fourier series, then we are talking about the trigonometric Fourier series coefficients. We'll take a look at them later on. So we are trying to find out the magnitude of A2. How strong is my sinusoid, which has the frequency 2 omega naught or minus 2 omega naught, right? That's the, actually, I'm not even going for A minus 2. I'm only going for A sub plus 2. So at 2 omega naught, that's what I want to find out. So what I'll do is, first I'll prove this, then I will generalize it to k instead of 2, I'll say k, what would happen? Generalize it. And that will give me an, a, a formula to compute any Fourier series coefficient. There are going to be a lot of formulas coming your way, a lot of properties, a lot of transforms, a lot of tables coming your way. The sooner that you, you start using those tables to solve problems, the better it is going to be, right? Because I want you guys to stick to a, a routine. All right, this property, where is it? This property, where is it? This transform, where is it? To help you with this, I've uploaded a document called Fourier series and Fourier transform tables to Piazza under general resources. So if you stick to one resource, then you're always using the same resource and then you're not con confusing yourself, right? So stick to that. Next, let's talk about how do you find A sub two. Multiply this continuous time signal x of t with e to the minus j two omega naught t. We wanted to find A2, we are multiplying by e to the j two omega naught t. I have this as reference over here from before. X of t represented as a sum summation of all those Fourier series uh, projections, exponential Fourier series projections. So what did I do on left? I said x multiplied by e to the minus j two omega naught t. And similarly, I would have to multiply it on the right side as well. And when I do that on the right side, I can combine the e to the j k omega naught t from here and e to the j minus two omega naught t that I just multiplied. So I'm multiplying, I'm adjusting the power of that exponential accordingly. Now let's integrate over one time period. When I integrate over one time period for both left hand side and right hand side, what am I going to get? On the left, I have integration of this for one time period. By the way, what is t? Can anybody express t in terms of omega naught? t is your, go ahead. So t is one over f zero, right? So f zero is what? Omega zero divided by two pi? Right? So whatever you had over here, 
you are computing t based on that and integrating over that one time period. So you are doing that on the left, and you are also going to do that on the right for this guy. You are uh, integrating with respect to time. So the summation with respect to k can be pulled out of that integration now. Doesn't have a t there, but this guy does have a t there. So I'm going to leave that in, inside the integral. Now, this is why exponential series work. Now, look at this. You have a summation. k is going from negative infinity to infinity. You have that a sub k. And then you have this integration. We already said, if you integrate over complex exponential over one time period, it is going to go to 0. We said that, right? Now we are saying 2 omega naught, 3 omega naught, and so on, right? So cosine over one time period goes to 0. Two time period is also goes to 0. Three time period is also goes to 0. So if you apply that, what are you going to be left with? You see, summation a sub k, so you have this is giving you, this guy is giving you a negative 1. Before that, it gave you a negative 2, a negative 3, and so on on the left. Over there, you have a sub negative 1 a sub 0, a sub 1, a 2, and so on. So that is taking care of the a sub k part. Next, you have e to the integration over this, right? k minus 2. So when k is negative 1, sorry, negative infinity to infinity, you are going to have that specific power of the exponential. Over here, when k is negative 1, you would get this. When k is negative 2, uh, you get this, uh, not negative 2, 2. k is 1. k is 2, right? So k is going negative 1, 0, 1, 2, and so on. What is going to happen to these integrations? They are all going to go to 0 except what is that going to go to? 1. But 1, you are integrating for how much time? For one time period. That's why it goes to 1, right? So you have everything going to 0 except for that one guy. You guys see that? On the left and on the right, they are also going to the going, going to zero. The only thing that will be non-zero is what a two. You see, that's why we wanted to. That's why we did these steps because we were after a two. So on the next slide here, we are going to write that result over there, which is I took a one integrated over t, so I got a two t. This guy is a 1, but I'm integrating it for cap t seconds. So the whole thing will give me just cap t. So I've got 0, 0, 0 here, a2 t there, bunch of zeros. So I can rearrange and write a2 cap t is going to equal this, whatever I had in my left hand side. First I multiplied by that exponential, then I integrated both sides. So I now can find. The, the magnitude of this second harmonic as 1 over t integration over one time period x of t e to the minus j 2 omega naught t dt, where omega naught is 2 pi divided by t, or t is 2 pi divided by omega naught. Now, you see, a2, you got a 2 there, right? When you start doing this for a general case, like a sub k, k Fourier series coefficient, what are you going to get? You are going to simply adjust this, right? So a sub k, which is the magnitude of the kth harmonic, is going to have this particular formula, 1 over t. You need to know the time period of that periodic signal. Integration over only one time period, the periodic signal itself, the value of the periodic signal over that one time period, right? It could be linear, then x of t becomes t. It could be a constant, x of t becomes 5, and so on. Then you have this exponential, e to the negative j k omega naught t. And then you are integrating with respect to time t. 
we have talked about these relationships before. Omega naught, 2 pi, 2 pi F0, T is 1 over F0. We, we, have, we have talked about these things before. So this is one thing, right? So there are two things here. One, given x of t, can you find out a k? The second is, given a k, can you find out x of t? Right? You can twist it in two ways. This formula lets you go one way. Given x of t, you can find out the exponential Fourier series coefficient. This guy allows you to do the other way. Given a k, you can find out the x of t. Now, let's talk about these x of k, a sub k's. What are a sub k's for a series coefficient? What does k, zero, k equals 0 signify? What does a sub 0 indicate? a sub 0, oh, that is a1 and a minus 1. dc, right? So dc. So if I move any, say you have a sinusoid, right? Or you have, don't take a sinusoid because that's going to be very simple, only one frequency. Take a square wave. You have a square wave over here. You're moving it up and down vertically. What are you changing? Which coefficient are you changing? A sub zero, that's it. All the others are going to remain as is. You guys see that? Because the first harmonic might change, second harmonic might, uh, will not change. All the frequencies will not change. You're just moving it up and down. Only A sub zero will change. The DC term will change. Here is an interesting question. What if you move them left and right? Instead of a vertical shift, what if you did a horizontal shift on that signal? Which coefficient will change? Uh, which coefficient? So A sub k is, in the A sub k, which one will change and which one will not change? So here, when we moved it up and down, we said we are playing with the DC component of the signal, right? The average value of the signal. So A sub zero was changing, all the other coefficients were staying as is. Now when you move it left and right, are you changing the DC value? Nope. The DC value is the same. So you're not changing A sub zero, however you're changing all the other Fourier series coefficients. You see it's flipped. Do you see that? We will talk about it a little bit more formally when we get into a vertical shift property and a horizontal shift property. But until then, we are going to stick with this particular uh, integration formula for A sub k and a summation formula for x of t. Now, this is a square wave that has been pushed up a little bit. So its average is non-zero. Our goal is going to be to use that formula that we just derived to find the Fourier series coefficients of this square wave. So here is how things are going to go with this. You are going to have certain Fourier series coefficients as reference results. These I have derived and these are given to me. All the other questions are going to be different from that. But if you use certain properties, you will be able to use these standard results. That's going to be the ball game from now on. Can you use the properties of Fourier series and translate your problem to one of these standard forms and use the standard result. Right? That, that's, that's where things are going to be. So in order to derive one of the standard results, the first standard result that we are going to need is what? Square wave. Square wave whose uh, average is non-zero right, right now. So find and sketch the Fourier series coefficients of, of A sub k for this particular periodic signal. So what is the time period of this periodic signal? Anyone? Uh, should have asked without showing you the answer. Four, right? Four time units is the time period of this signal. How do you know that? The center here is zero, the center here is four. So after four seconds, it is repeating, right? Or you could say this edge is negative one, this edge is three. After four seconds, it is repeating. So the time period is four. Right away, what did you get? Time period is four. Omega naught is two pi divided by cap T. Omega naught is pi over two. That's the first step I want you guys to do. Figure out the time period, figure out omega naught. Next, look at how I've represented this x of t. I have this signal over here, which is on for certain amount of time, and then it is zero for rest of the time. 
x of t an arrow that goes both ways what does that mean that means that given x of t i can compute fourier series coefficient or given the fourier series coefficients i can go back and compute the x of t i can go either way fs standing for fourier series coefficients a sub k r the fourier series coefficients i need to figure these out this is a question mark for this so once i have figured out the time period i'm going to try to evaluate the average value of the signal average value of the signal so i'm trying to make this problem structured right i want to give you guys some steps to follow first step was evaluate cap t evaluate omega naught second step is evaluate the average value of the signal evaluating the average value of the signal for this is going to be very straightforward why half the time it is 1 half the time it is 0 the average value should be a half right is that right half the time it is 1 half the time it is 0 so what is the average value one half how can you find that out integrate the signal divided by one over t finding the average value of any sequence involves two things add up everything and divide it by the number of things right so integrate x of t and divided by one over t let's try to simplify this what does this indicate what does this indicate area where one time period right so it's just asking you this area of a rectangle one times two two so you got two there for this guy you can do the integration but you can also do the calculation in this case very quickly one over, what about 1 over t? 1 over t, t we computed as 4 earlier. Plug it in there, you have got half for the answer. I am finding a sub 0 first. Next, and there is a reason for that. I'll explain you why. Next, uh, a quick note about when, how you should choose your integration limits. As you can see, you could have chosen negative 1 to 3. Right? Because you are integrating over one time period, you could have said 0 to 4, or you could have said negative 1 to 3. But if your signal is even, symmetric about the vertical axis, then try to pick the integration limits that are also even, symmetric. Negative t over 2 to t over 2. So the obvious next question is what? Will I get a wrong answer if I picked? The other time period, say, instead of picking negative, uh, negative t over 2 to t over 2, what if I picked 0 to t? Will I get a wrong answer? So what will be different then? If it's not the wrong answer, then what will be different? What? No, the coefficients will be the same. The coefficients numerically have to be the same. What? Uh, the final answer will look different. Numerically, it will be the same, but it will appear different. It might be a little bit difficult to simplify. Go ahead. No, it will not be shifted. The only thing that will uh, be different is how it looks. Mathematically, when you evaluate it, it will be the same. Right? Two, number two. Ian says one plus one is two. When it says 4 minus 2 is 2, they're both right. They got the same 2, but they express them differently, right? So if you pick a different integration limit, yeah, you will get the right answer. You will get the exact same answer. It will be just represented in a more complicated manner. So if you want to have a easy time doing the math for these integrations, if you notice an even signal, try to pick the limits of your integrations that are also symmetric. And we will demonstrate this with an example later on. OK, questions about how we started. Time period, finding a sub 0. Good, everybody? Yeah, 
All right, next, let us try to find out. Oh, go ahead, Zach. Absolutely. Uh, I think I can do, do away with this. And then I can also bottom this. And then maybe even do this. All right, uh, Alan, you're still in the meeting? All right, so if there are any questions, please let me know. Uh, all right, let's continue. Uh, what did we, we talked about this, done. Now, let's try to find a sub k. We already did k equals zero, so we are now trying to find out a sub k when k is not equal to zero, right? All the other k's. Formula remains the same. a k is one over t, integration over one time period, x of t, e to the minus j k omega naught t. Dt, substitute t as 1 over, uh, substitute t as 4, integration limits are going to be negative t over 2 to t over 2, so that's your uh, negative 2 to 2. The signal itself is a constant, right, so x of t is 1 there, and then you are integrating over an exponential, complex exponential. That should be very straightforward, right? e to the minus jx is what? Negative minus jx divided by uh, jx. So that's what you get. 1 over 4 for 1 over t, complex exponential, and then you have divided it by the power of that exponential. It's a definite integral, so you have also plugged in negative 1 and 1. So now, a question that I get usually, here you said negative 2 to 2. Here, why did you put in negative 1 and 1? It is zero over here, and it is zero over here, right? So I don't even have anything over there for x of t, yeah? So I don't need to include that in my definite integral. All right, so that's how I got that. Substitute the limits. You have got the first piece over here, second piece over here. Is it in a convenient form? e to the minus jx minus e to the minus j plus x, right? What is that? So if you, if you look at this, you see e to the minus j x, where I'm saying this guy is x, right? And this is what? e to the plus j x. So I'm literally doing e to the minus j x minus e to the j x. So what is that equal? Good negative 2 sine x. Right? Negative 2j sine x. You have simply used this. Sine x equals e to the jx minus e to the minus jx divided by 2j. You simply use that for this. Okay. So that's going to give you something which is going to cancel out, out right? You see, you have got a negative here that is going to cancel out with the negative there. You have got a j there that will cancel out with that j there. Then you have got a sine x that carries over. x is our k uh, pi over 2k. That will come over here. You are left with this k pi over 2 over here. So that, that's there. And then this 2 and this 4 will give you this 2 remains. Yeah? Just simplified it. And this is going to be for all k that is that are not equal to 0. Because a, a sub 0 we have already evaluated. If you simplify this, you will get a sink. What is a sink function? Sink x. Sink x is sine x over x. Sink x equals sine x over x. You guys have used sink function before? Never? None of the other classes? Okay. So, sync function looks like what would happen uh, to the ripples, how the ripples would look like in a pond after you drop a stone in it. Not skip it, like drop a stone in it. What, what, what does it look like when you drop a stone? Well, yeah, but the ripples are going to decay, right? So, it's going to look something like this. That's how a sync function looks like, sine x over x.
So that's your standard result for this particular periodic signal, square wave. Square wave that is also having some parameters, right? We didn't say uh, any time period. We said time period is four. Um, so for this, it is half sync k pi over two. But this applies for k not equal to zero. Our next goal is going to be to combine them. So here, so far we are doing this. So far we are able to write that x of t has the Fourier series coefficients of a sub k, and we are denoting that in bracket notation first. It is half when k equals zero. That's what we evaluated first, the average value of the signal. Next, we said it is half sync k pi over two when k doesn't equal zero. That's your answer for a sub k. Now, if you switch it around, you can write x of t as, you see, you remember this formula, right? x of t, once you have the Fourier series coefficients, you can write the periodic signal as the summation of all those projections. So once you have the a sub, a sub k, you can do this. I have pulled out the half over here. That was corresponding to k sub zero, uh, k equals zero. Because when k equals zero, this guy would have been what? A one. So I can pull out the half over here, that's your DC term. All the other terms, when k equals negative infinity all the way up to infinity, apart from k equals zero, can go in here. Half sync k pi over two for the a sub k. e to the j k omega naught t remains as is. I've literally pulled out the half for the DC term uh, outside the summation. Uh, a quick correction over here. This doesn't need to be approximately equal to. This is equal to. Because I've included all the harmonics, negative infinity to infinity. So as k tends to infinity, it will it will be tending to equal to instead of approximately equal to. Questions here? Now there's one more thing we can do here. We can try to combine these two things. Essentially the question is, instead of writing it as a bracket notation, is this guy included in this? Can, could I say half, is it or not? When k equals zero, what would happen? You would get half sync Zero. What is sync zero? Sine zero over zero. Sine zero over zero is a L'Hopital rule. One, right? So you will get back your half. So it is, right? You will get back your half. So it is included. So we'll say all k, it is half sync k pi over two. Did I see that? You are going to use L'Hopital rule to, do, to suggest that. Now a quick note about sync x. You're going to see sync a lot. And when you're trying to do this on paper, in our problems, try to represent sync as sine x over x. That's what we will be using for this class. Sync x is sine x over x. However, MATLAB uses a slightly different formula. MATLAB uses sine pi x over pi x. But there is only one difference here. There's only a very subtle difference in how this function uh, looks. So what I'll try to do is this. Sine x over x will look like this. However, where are the zero crossings? When does it cross over here and here and here and so on? Where are the zero crossings? Pi, right. So I've got pi here, two pi there, and pi, and then similarly over here, right? Negative pi, negative two pi, and so on. Those are the zero crossings for sine x over x. However, what would be over here? Sine pi x over here, uh, sine pi x over pi x, n, right? So it'll be one, two, three, negative one, negative two, and so on. When x is on the x-axis, I have x. So over here, it is integers. What we are going to use is integer multiples of pi. That's the only difference. In some textbooks also, uh, they use sine pi x over x. 
So it's not wrong, it's just a different definition. Questions? We are going to stick with sine x over x, a little bit more traditional uh, definition of thing. Going once, twice, sold. So let's try to evaluate the first six harmonics of this half think k pi over 2 function. So on the left column, I have k going from 0 to 6. So the 0 is evaluating the DC term. And then I have the first six harmonics only on the positive side. I'm not evaluating them on the uh, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3. I'm not evaluating that. And like we said, k equals 0, it is simply half sync 0, half sync 0. Sync 0 is sine 0 by 0. And if you use L'Hopital rule, it will be a 1. So it will be a cosine divided by x, plug in a 0, you're done there. Um, cosine divided by a 1. Next, plug in a 1 in there. What do you get? Half sync pi over 2. Sync pi over 2, evaluate it. Sine pi over 2 divided by pi over 2. You will be left with 1 over pi. And do the same thing. What do you get? You will get this table. A1, A2, A3, A4, A5, and so on. What do you notice? The first thing that you notice is all the even harmonics are going to a 0. This is a very famous property of a square wave. A square wave has this property that all its even harmonics are 0. And all its ha odd harmonics are going this way, 1 over pi, negative 1 over 3 pi. The sign is alternating, plus, minus, plus, minus. And it is 1 over pi. And your third will have 3 in the denominator. Fifth will have 5 in the denominator, and so on. Now, if you can do this for k is positive, you can also do this when k is negative. right? You can plug in k and negative 1, neg negative 2, negative 3. Is it going to be different? The values, are they going to be different? When you plug in negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, and so on. A sync function is blank, even odd. Even, right? So if a sync function is even, I plug in a plus k or a minus k should be giving you me the same thing, right? So if I go plus over here, minus will also give me the same coefficient, right? Minus 1, minus 2 is going to give me the same answer for the negative ones. So with all that information, we can start. Let me come back to this later on. With all that information, we can catch the Fourier series coefficients. So what do you have here? On the y-axis, we have the Fourier series coefficients a sub k. k is on the x-axis. k over here is an integer. Right? 0, 1, 2, 3, and so on over here. Negative 1, negative 2, and so on over there. The DC term, right there. First harmonics. Second harmonic goes to 0. Third harmonics. Fourth harmonic goes to 0, and so on. I'm literally taking the table and plotting it. A few things to note. One, the on envelope of the signal it has a sync shape. Well, that's obvious, almost. It is coming from a sync function, so it's going to have a sync envelope, right? So that's sync. Next, the coefficients are even, right? When you look at the coefficients, a1 equals a negative 1, a2 equals a negative 2. The Fourier series coefficients are real, and even, yeah? Fourier series coefficients are real and even because our signal that we started off with was real and even. Yeah, real, even, yeah, that's one property. That's one symmetry property of Fourier series coefficients. If the signal that you start off with is real and even, then the Fourier series coefficients will also be real and even. We'll take a look at the symmetry properties later on when we start talking about the properties of Fourier series. Uh, let's see, next. We talked about changing the uh, DC term. When you move a signal up and down, 
say, add some constant c to it, the only thing that changes is a sub zero. A sub zero will get added up, added with that offset that you added to the signal. All the others will remain as is. Uh, right, we, we talked about that. A sub k is a minus k for this example. Even coefficient for even signal. Real coefficient, so uh, real in even signal, real in even coefficients. Next, okay. Now, what can you do with this information? Uh, so for that, let me ask you this. Some of you have taken circuits. Uh, did, did you guys talk about the Fourier transform of a rectangle there at all? No. Um, so a Fourier transform of a rectangle, what do you think it will be? Fourier transform of a rectangle will be a sink. A rectangle and a sink are Fourier transform pairs. You're going to hear me say this like 1,300 times. Rectangle and a sink. You need to map this in your head. Rectangle sink. So what did we do here? That was the Fourier transform. Fourier trans when you get to Fourier transform, then you will have that mapping. A rectangle will map to a sink. So if a signal is rectangle in the time domain, in the frequency domain, it's going to be a sink, and vice versa. If the signal is a sink in the time domain, it will be a rectangle in the frequency domain. What do we have over here? A periodic rectangle, right? So a periodic signal. When you make things periodic in one domain, you actually sample in the other domain. So when we made this, so when I say rectangle to sink, both continuous, Fourier transform, it's not periodic rectangle, just one period, uh, one rectangle. When, you, when I made that rectangle periodic, in the frequency domain, I literally sampled the signal. So I had a sign, I sampled it. It became this. So what are some operations? Uh, here, let, let us talk about it in a, in a more general sense. If I change something in the time domain, do you guys agree that there will be some corresponding change in the frequency domain? Yeah? I'm not talking about loudly speaking, or I'm not talking about the amplitude, but I'm talking about maybe delaying the signal or differentiating the signal. If I do anything in, in, to the signal in the time domain, its frequency domain characteristics will change. One such property is, if I made things periodic in the time domain, I will be sampling in the frequency domain. And vice versa. They are always Fourier transform pairs. If I did sampling in the sampling in the time domain, what would happen in the frequency? Periodic. I will take this one band and then I'll make it periodic in the frequency domain. If I was sampling in the time domain. Next, let's talk about another famous, very useful property. If you are doing multiplication in the time domain of two signals, you are doing convolution of those signals in the frequency domain. Convolution in one domain translates to multiplication in the other domain. So these are very, very, you're good. I hope that you will take the full advantage of these properties as we go through. Right now, we just, talk, we just scratched the surface here. Time domain, yes. So what you are multiplying in the frequency domain is what? Fourier transform of the individual signals, right? You're, you're multiplying things in the frequency domain that translates to convolution of the time domain signals. So, <laughs> yes, we are not done with convolution just yet. We are not done, what was it? Oh. Uh, and there, there, there are many other uh, properties like that. All right. Let's play with this uh, square wave a little bit more. So on the top here, we have the periodic signal x of t. We, are, we were trying to figure out the Fourier series coefficients in a sub k over there. And we got this. This is our reference result. a sub 0 evaluated to be a half. And a sub k evaluated to be a half 
sync k pi over 2, and this is actually for all k, like all k will satisfy that. So let's try to figure out something by putting the first six harmonics of this signal together. So earlier I said x of t can be obtained by summing up all the projections. Over, over here, I'm just looking at the first six, so I'm doing an approximation. So k equals negative 6 to 6, a k e to the j k pi over 2 t. Same example, same time period, same omega naught. Now, if I break it up into six terms, actually seven terms, uh, sorry, not, not even seven. I'm going to get 13 terms, right? Negative 6 all the way to 6. So I'm going 12 there, and then include the 0, I've got 13 terms. So instead of all the 13 terms, I don't have to write all the even ones because I know all the even ones go to zero anyway, right? So right there, it comes down to seven terms. I've got negative five, negative three, negative one, but the zero, and then I've got one, three, and five. I'm using the fact that all the even harmonics go for a zero here. So now what, what, what can I do? You start observing patterns in here. You have this guy and this guy. One, we know their value is the same because a sync function is even. We know their value is the same. Also, e to the minus jx, e to the plus jx, I could combine them into a cosine, right? So I'm combining those two over here. This is a sub 5, which also equals a sub minus 5. Next, so that, that sort of gives me that. Next, a3, a negative 3. I've got that. I'm essentially combining the terms that have the same power so that I can convert them into a cosine later. So a negative 1, a negative 1 plus 1 here. Combine them, you've got that. How did you know A1 was 1 over pi? Well, I, you, you remember I tabulated all the data earlier. That's how I know. Uh, A0 is left over. That's half. That's left over from uh, the seven, seven things that we left with. Now, we can say, all right, now it's going to be in a very nice form. Use e to the jx plus e to the minus jx divided by 2 that is as cosine x. So if you use this three times, you get a cosine for this guy. So let's see, this is going to be yellow. This is going to be green. Oh, yes, no, no, no. This is going to be green. And then this guy in the middle is going to be for the third one. Is it real? We expected a real and even answer, right? This is at least real. And it's a bunch of cosines. So it's looking like it might be even as well. Even signal, but with an offset of half. Yeah? Now let's try to plot it. For plotting purposes, I've written up a very simple code here. Uh, there, is a, there is a half included in here. That is a sub 0. There is a x1. So that's 2 over pi with a cosine, x3, another cosine, x5, another cosine. So by using uh, fa functions in MATLAB, cosine functions in MATLAB, I've literally defined those things for some time. What is that time? Negative 6 to 6. So I'm looking at negative 6 seconds to plus 6 seconds. If I, uh, x approximation is 0 plus 1 plus 3 plus 5. What are those? Those are projections. DC, first harmonic, third harmonic, fifth harmonic, both plus and minus, right? If I plot them out, that's how it looks like. So the blue is the exact signal. And the red is, I have taken the uh, first harmonic, I've taken the third harmonic, I've taken the fifth harmonic, I've added them together. That's how it looks like so far with the red line. And I hope you see that as you increase k to infinity, you are going to get very, 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 very close to that square wave, right? 
So if you have sort of um, looked at a ideal a, a square wave on an oscilloscope, really good quality oscilloscope, how does that square wave look like? It looks like this, but it you know, it'll have a very sharp jump, and then it'll settle down very quickly, right? So there will be that ringing, but it'll be a very sharp ringing, and settling time will be very small. Uh, that's for six. Now, if you look at it in terms of what did we do to get that red signal, that's what we did. A0 was the DC term, half. That's right here. A1 was the fundamental frequency. What is that fundamental? The yellow line, dash line, that. The next thing we added, third harmonic, which is the dashed line there. There's that guy. You can clearly see the dashed blue line is three times the frequency of the, the yellow line, third harmonic instead of first. And then the fifth harmonic right there. You add them all together. When you add them all together, you get the approximation, that. The sig signal that we plotted on top of the square wave. But so this is just to demonstrate that the goal is to break up that square wave into its pieces, right? Projections. First harmonic, second harmonic. So when you combine them, you should get back the same thing. So the, the Fourier series coefficients are really the amplitudes of this guy, right? He's got this guy, this guy, this guy, and so on. And like you see, you, they're going down. That's what we saw with the sink going down on both sides. Questions? Let's try to generalize. You're not always going to see a square wave which has a time period of four and it is on from negative one to one, and it is off from one to three, right? That's not going to be the case. You are most likely going to need a standard result for a square wave in this form, where x of t is your signal, the amplitude can be one, no problem with the amplitude because I can always multiply uh, the amplitude on left-hand side if it scales by m, the Fourier series coefficients scale by m. So that I can figure out later. However, I'm, I have included arbitrary times now. Negative t1 to t1, it is 1. And between t1 and the next on time, it is 0. The time period is cap t. Can I see that? So the time period of the square wave is cap t. But t1 and negative t1 indicate the on time, right? Negative t1 to t1, that's the on time. I'm going to, instead of sketching it every time, I'm going to call it in this standard form. You see, pulse T1 comma T. T1 indicates what this value is. T indicates what this value is. So if, if I sketch it over here, this is going to be T. Right? So this guy is this guy, and this guy is the time period. Now you can say 1, 4, or 2, 5, wh whatever values. Earlier, what did we have? So what was this? T1, comma T. One four. No. So that's what we are trying to do. We are trying to find the Fourier series coefficients of this generic pulse train. Impulse train, a train of impulses, one after the other, periodic. Pulse train, pulse, 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 a pulse train. That's what we have. A square wave. So based on the steps that I gave you guys. You say, first, I, I'll evaluate the time period. What is the time period? Well, it is t. And omega naught is 2 pi over t. We are doing this for the general case. Next, what is a sub 0? The average value of the signal. Find the area over here and divide it by the time period. So what, what will that be? Let's try to do it over here. 
what is the area going a sub zero? What is the area? Uh, one times two t one, yeah. So two t one. What do I need to divide it by? T. So that's a sub zero. You can do the normal way too, right? So you can do integration over one time period divided by the time, and you get that. If if things are very nice shapes, rectangles and triangles, calculating area will be very quick. So you find out the a sub zero, the DC term for that. By the way, this does this satisfy the earlier earlier result? Earlier result we had what? One and four for T1 and T. So if you plug that in, two T1 divided by T. Two times one divided by four. Ha. Satisfies what we had earlier. Next. Let's try to do it for a sub k, the general. K. What do you have? One over t, integration over one time period, x of t, e to the j k omega naught t. Now I need to pick out the limits of this integration. What do you guys think? What should I use for the integration limits? Negative, okay. So negative t over 2 to t over 2. However, you can modify that to negative t1 over to t1 because the other part is 0 anyway, right? But I'm going to leverage the fact that this guy is even. So I'll do that. Negative t1 to t1. Yeah? 1 over t remains as is. Now you have e to the negative jk omega naught t. Integrating a complex exponential shouldn't be that bad. When you do that, and plug in the limits, this is what you get as your answer. 2t1 divided by t, sink k omega naught t1. This is for k doesn't, that doesn't equal 0. In fact, when you try to look at it later on, you can actually combine them, right? So the general approach should be this. This is important, you guys. This is usually some people miss this. Let's try to evaluate the DC term first then evaluate a sub k. Later on, you see whether you can include a sub 0 in your a sub k or not. If you can't, express it in the bracket notation. If you can, then I include it and say for all k. This is what we are doing. We evaluated a sub 0 here, evaluated a sub k here, and then we said, let's check whether it satisfies or not. So for k equals 0, a k is going to be what? 2t1, because this is going to be sync zero is a one sine x over x, L'Hopital rule, cosine divided by one gives you a one. So this using L'Hopital rule satisfies this guy, which means you can combine them and say, the Fourier series coefficients of a pulse strain equals two T one divided by T sync K omega naught T one. This is for all K. What does that mean? That means that any square wave that you guys come across, you guys know their Fourier series coefficient. So I want to talk to you guys about something next. This was the pulse strain, right? We know the Fourier series coefficients of this. Now let's make it difficult. Now let's make it difficult and you guys tell me how difficult can you make this? Can you guys think about some things that you could do to this uh, generic pulse strain? Ideas? What could you do to these, this generic pulse strain? So you have this. What all can you modify about that? OK, so you are going to have it on for a different time and off for a different time. That is going to directly change your t1 and t, and you know the answer for that as well, right? Yeah. You, that is going to directly change your t1 and t, and you know the answer for that. Next, who else wants to change something? Amplitude. You make it bigger or smaller, right? When you make it bigger or smaller, a sub k will become scaled by the same amount. Hi, why? Well, look at this. a k equals 1 over t integration of x of t. x of t becomes m times longer, uh, bigger. a sub k becomes m times bigger, right? It comes out of that. OK, so scaling, I have taken care of it. Next, what, are, what else do you want to do with it? Go ahead. Vertical shift. Okay, so you want to do a vertical shift of this general pulse strain. What changes? A sub zero. All the others stay the same except A sub zero. A sub zero changes to a different value. 
the only adjustment that I'll need to do is what? Break this guy up into a piecewise model. When k is zero, include the offset. When k is not equal to zero, write it in this form. Done. What else do you want to do with this? We talked about a vertical shift. We talked about scaling it uh, amplitude-wise. We talked about scaling it horizont uh, horizontally as well. What else do you want to do with this? Go ahead. Sorry? Time inversion. Oh, when you flip it also, T1 and T will change. Right? T1 and T will change. You know the answer for that. Go ahead. Horizontal shift. Nice. When you do a horizontal shift, what is it? A delay in time. When you do a delay in time, you will have a phase shift in the Fourier series coefficient. When are we going to talk about that? We are going to talk about that as a time shift property that's coming up. So you have the standard result. Using the time shift property, you can calculate the Fourier series coefficient of the time shifted version. It's going to only change the phase. What, what else? So that's time shift property. We are going to get there. Next. Now imagine a triangle wave. Think about a triangle wave, right? You have linear, 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 or even linear, like sawtooth, whatever you have. If you wanted to get that into the standard form, what would you need to do? You have a triangle waveform. You have a result for the square waveform. So you want to get this triangle into the square form. What do you need to do to the triangle? What? Oh, no, no. So if you multiply the triangle by two, it becomes bigger, right? What? Take its derivative, right? You take the derivative of the triangle, you get the square. So we talk about time derivative property. I don't need to figure out the Fourier series coefficients of the triangle. I just need to know the Fourier series coefficients of the, uh, the square wave with the time derivative property. If I deri differentiate the signal in time domain, I will be doing something to the Fourier series coefficients. It's a property. We'll prove it, and then we'll use it. What else? Let's do this. You have parabolas, a periodic parabolas. What do you do now? What? No, no, no. You have to get to the square. Differentiate it twice, right? You differentiate it twice, you get to the square wave. So use the time uh, differentiation property twice. Do I see that? So with one standard result, you guys can do a lot. You can, can do, deal with quadratic, cubic, even nth order functions that are periodic. You can deal with vertical shift, horizontal shift. Uh, somebody said scaling. You can do all of that. So a powerful result, something worth noting and uh, being able to use this is going to be helpful. Uh, next. Uh, didn't we talk about this? Yeah, we talked about this. Next. Instead of using the time period for this earlier, whatever we solved, instead of using it as an even um, time, say negative, t, negative 2 to 2, we used that earlier. right? If we use negative 2 to 2, we got one result, which was what? Half sync uh, k pi over 2. Instead, if we choose this, 0 to 4, what happens? You guys were said uh, it's going to be different. We talked about that earlier, right? We are going to get numerically the same answer. It's just going to be in a different form. You see what happens to this? If we choose 0 to 4 for our limits, t remains as is, but we are doing it from 0 to 4. Our answer simplified to be this. You see that? It's, so it's difficult to see that this equals half sync k pi over 2. It's a little bit difficult to get there, right? What makes it difficult? e to the j k pi over 2, e to the j k 3 pi over 2. The power of those exponentials are not the same. Can you make it the same? Yes. All you would have to do is factor out e to the j k pi. If you factor out e to the j k pi from this guy and this guy, you will be left with something like this, e to the j k pi over 2, 
minus e to the jk pi over 2 minus with the minus sign, then you can solve and you will get the answer. So the answer is still the same, except that you had to do a few manipulations to get there because you wanted these two guys to have the same power. Opposite signs, same power. Now with this, I want to talk to you guys about something else. Not blank, squared paper. Sure. What is the, simplify this. Simplify e to the j k pi. Negative one, negative one, raise two. So that's my claim. E to the negative, uh, e to the plus, actually, e to the plus or minus, e to the plus or minus jk pi is minus one raised to k. How did we get this? We drew a complex plane. Real numbers on the x axis, imaginary numbers on the y axis. Where is e to the jk pi? Uh, forget about e to the jk pi. Just look at e to the j pi. Where is e to the plus or minus j pi? Then we can raise it to k. Right? Where is e to the j pi? Well, for plus pi, you are going this way. For minus pi, you are going this way but you will be at negative one on the real axis. The amplitude will be one. Why is that? The amplitude or the magnitude of E to the JX is one. Everybody agrees that the magnitude of E to the JX is one? Yeah, cosine X plus J sine X, magnitude of a square uh, complex number. Square root of cosine squared plus sine squared, one. Yeah, okay. So. That's how we are getting that because e to the plus or minus j pi is a negative one and then raised to k will remain as is. What is the value of e to the j pi over two? I'm going here, right? So what? I'm purely imaginary. I'm purely imaginary, and I have an amplitude of one. Who am I? J, right? <laughs> Next, uh, what about this? How about minus? Negative J. Next. How about five e to the j pi over two? Five. So sometimes when you have a j, you may need to write that j in this form so that you can use it in your simplification. That usually doesn't happen. What usually happens is you will have something like this, e to the j pi over two, and you will need to observe and write it as a j. Questions about this? So that's what we have used here. So you see, e to the, when we pulled out e to the negative jk pi, we got a minus one raised to k for that. It is because of that reason. Uh, most of the other steps you guys should be fine. Um, so the conclusion is this. This is not exactly the same as what we got earlier. It doesn't look the same. However, if you actually evaluate all the AKs, things are going to match exactly. So it doesn't look the same, but mathematically is equivalent. That what? How you choose your time period determines that. The one recommendation that I have given is what? For an even, for an even signal, try to choose the time period that also is even. Questions here?
we now know the standard result for Fourier series coefficients. So on your homework that you guys are going to start today, um, I will give you guys a problem that uh, you need to solve without using the standard result. So you are going to be using the definition of Fourier series, the integrations. As we go to the next week, we will start using the tables, the standard results. Talked about this. Uh, right, you, that, that's fine. We talked about that as well. Approach to, we can have different, all the other different approaches. Let's begin our next lecture. So we'll make a start and then we'll continue it on Monday. Lecture nine is going to be about Fourier series coefficients of impulse train. Another standard result that we will need to derive and then use, just as we derived the Fourier series coefficients of a pulse train. Next, fundamental period of sum of periodic signals. If you had a sum of sinusoids with different frequencies, will the result be periodic or not? And if it is, what is the time period of that? What is the fundamental frequency of that? So sum up periodic signals have different frequencies and try to find the answer, or find the uh, period of the resulting signal. Next, properties of the Fourier series. Properties of exponential Fourier series is going to be sort of, if you, if you get it and if you know how to use it for the problems, that's going to be a really, really good uh, indicator of your exam two score. Linearity, vertical shift, horizontal shift, time flip, and derivative property. We'll have more uh, after this as well. So let's talk about the existence of Fourier series. When does AK exist? In order, a necessary and sufficient condition for the Fourier series of any periodic signal to exist is this. If you take the magnitude squared of the signal, which is essentially the energy in the signal, if it is finite, then the Fourier series coefficients exist. If it is not finite, then AKs cannot be computed. They are not, uh, they don't, don't exist. Also, as you include more and more projections of this X of T signal, as you evaluate it to K equals infinity, the error of that approximation goes to zero. And we saw that with six harmonics, it was getting close to that square wave, but it was not actually square wave. Energy of the signal has to be finite in order for the Fourier series coefficients to exist. Next, Fourier series of impulse train. Let's do a fun exercise first, and then we can get into the calculations later on. Can you guys help me represent this X of T as a summation? Anyone? So instead of using, I, I'll not use K, I will use N. Negative infinity, infinity. I have a delta. Is that okay? Where do you think this guy is going to be helpful? Impulse strain. Why? Where do you think this guy will play a role? Well, sampling. There you go. So when you are sampling, you are actually taking a signal and multiplying it with this guy, right? So what does it look like in the frequency domain? If you are multiplying a signal with an impulse strain in time, what are you doing in frequency? You are taking the convolution, right? So you're taking the convolution of what? Fourier transform of the impulse train, Fourier transform of the signal, and convolving them, right? A little bit out in the future, this topic, but that's what, uh, that's where you will see this. Uh, okay, so next, time period. What is the time period of this guy? T, what is omega naught? Oh, omega naught. 
right? F0 is 1 over t, yes. But omega naught is 2 pi over t, yeah? Find A sub 0, the average value of the signal. What is the average value of the signal? I need to consider this guy, right? I'm going to say 1 over t, which time period should I use? 0 to t or negative t over 2 to t over 2? Yep. And then what do I have after that? Done? Okay. So what is this going to give me? Just 1 over t. You are integrating over the impulse. Impulse is included. Its weight is 1. Its integration will give you 1. Okay. So A sub 0 is done. 1 over t. What is A sub k? We have the formula. Let us just evaluate it. 1 over t remains as is. The integration will be from negative t over 2 to t over 2. x of t is delta of t. You have e to the minus j k omega naught t as is and dt as is. So when you multiply a signal, a time signal with an impulse, what do you need to do? A signal multiplied by an impulse, what do you have? You have to evaluate that signal at the time this is valid. What is that? Zero? Right, so when you plug in zero here, what do you get? One, right, so I get a one for this, right? So I'm back to what? If this guy is one, and I'm integrating from negative t over two to t over two delta of t, am I not back to a sub zero? Yeah, so this should also be what? One over t? You guys agree with that? So what do you have? The standard result for Fourier series of an impulse train, A sub k equals 1 over t for all k. Let us sketch it. On the x-axis, I have k. On the y-axis, I have A sub k. What should I plot? 1 over t, 1 over t, 1 over t, 1 over t, right? So let's do that. Uh, let's make this bigger. And let's say, this and then let's say dot 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 black continues continues straight lines is that it what is the height of these guys one over t, right? So you tell me the time period of that impulse train, I will tell you this sketch. What is the envelope of this guy? Like, like we said, for a pulse train, the envelope of the Fourier series coefficients look like a sink, right? What is the envelope here? A constant. During the first class, we had this conversation about the king of all signals. Ian, I remember, said sinusoid. King of all signals, you say sign. But I disagreed. I said impulse. And one of the reasons I said in an impulse, I, say, I, I told you guys the reason, uh, as it has all frequencies. Look at this. When the impulse was periodic, you essentially sampled a constant in frequency. That's what you have, right? In an impulse train, is giving you a sampled constant. When you look at the Fourier transform of an impulse, it will be that, a constant. It will have all frequencies. So a signal that has all frequencies. Special, don't you think? Questions about how we derived it, how we sketched it. Fourier series coefficients of the square wave. Fourier series coefficients of an impulse train. You're all okay with that? Next, we have a fundamental period 
of sum of periodic signals. So let's try to see what happens to the time period and frequency of a signal when you have that signal being expressed as sum of two periodic signals, x1 and x2. So x1 is a periodic signal with time period t1, and x2 is another periodic signal with time period t2. So they have different time periods and frequencies. You are adding them up, you get x of t. What would be the time period and frequency of x of t? Well, the time period of the sum of those two signals is literally the lowest common multiple, least common multiple of the two time periods. So find the time period of the first signal, time period of the second signal, and then the LCM of the two will give you the time period of the sum of those two periodic signals. And if that is the LCM, for the frequency, it will be the GCD, greatest common divisor. So find T1, find T2, the greatest common divisor of those two values will give you the fundamental frequency of the sum of those two periodic signals. Let us do an example about this. And you can obviously extend it to three and four and finite number of signals. The example that we have over here is, you have two sinusoids. One is sine four pi divided by five t. The other guy is cosine two pi divided by five t. In this case, they are both periodic. You, they, you, you can find out their time period, and then you can use the LCM or the GCD function later. What is our goal? Our goal is to find out T0 and F0, the time period and the fundamental frequency of the sum of those two sinusoids. So let's try to find omega 1, omega 2 first. Omega 1, 4 pi divided by 5. I don't even need to convert the sine to a cosine or cosine to a sine here. I'm just worried about the frequency and time period. Omega 1, 4 pi divided by 5. Omega 2, 2 pi divided by 5. If you know omega, you can find out f, just divided by 2 pi. When you divide by 2 pi, you are left with 2 by 5 over here, 1 over 5 over there. At any stage, if you guys are so, sort of, uh, if things are becoming fast, just raise your hand, stop, and we'll, we'll slow it down. If you know the frequencies, then you invert them to get the time period. 2 over 5 becomes 5 over 2, 1 over 5 becomes 5. Next. Let us use that formula. T0, which is the fundamental time period of the sum of those two sinusoids, is the lowest common multiple of T1 and T2. T1, 5 over 2 from here. T2, 5 from here. Least common multiple. So if you pull out a half from these two, what are you left with? Least common multiple of 5 and 10, which is 10. So half multiplied by 10, 5. 5 is your fundamental period of x of t, and then 1 over 5 will be the fundamental frequency of x of t. Using this approach, you can find out the fundamental period and fundamental frequency of 2, 3, 4, any number of periodic signals. Just need to evaluate the LCM and GCD. Well, even if you find LCM, you can just invert that to find the GCD. Next. Properties of Fourier series. Some things are going to be looking very similar to properties of Fourier, uh, sorry, con convolution. Linearity property. Let's talk about that first. What do we have? X of t is a periodic signal whose Fourier series coefficients are given to us as a sub k. If that is the case, then if you multiply X of t with a scalar alpha, 5, 10, 100, the Fourier series coefficients will also get scaled by the same amount. Very easy to prove. You look at the integration uh, formula for a sub k, you multiply x of t, it's going to be the same as multiplying a k by uh, that same scalar. Now, that's, uh, that's what? That's the homogeneity property, right? But in this case, it is for Fourier series. Next, what about summing up two signals? Uh, additivity property, does it satisfy or not? Given x of t's Fourier series coefficients are a sub k, and y of t's 
for a series coefficients are b sub k, then if you sum up the signals in the time domain, x of t plus y of t, the Fourier series coefficients also get added up. Again, very easy to prove why integration of this plus integration of that, right? So using the uh, integration formula for computing a k, we can prove these properties very easily. Uh, so you may have x of t as a square wave, y of t as an impulse train. So now you know what the Fourier series coefficients are going to be for a signal that it has square waves and has uh, impulses shooting up in the middle, right? On, on top of the square wave, when you add those up, it is simply going to be what? Half sync k pi over two plus one over t. I see that? Just add up the Fourier series coefficients. Now, if you combine the homogeneity and the additivity property, you get what? Linearity property. So, we have two signals, x and y. We know the Fourier series coefficients of x and we know the Fourier series coefficients of y as ak and bk. That's given. We are trying to find the Fourier series coefficients of a signal ax of t plus b y of t, where a and b are scalars. It is going to be cap A, A K plus cap B multiplied by B K. That's your linearity property. It's there, can be proved by using the integration formula. But really, you really understand the linearity property, use it in a problem, and then you see the, the, the advantage of that. So this is the last thing that I want to do today. I want us to figure out the Fourier series coefficients of this signal. It's a periodic signal, so we should be able to find the Fourier series, and its energy is, is finite, so we should be able to do it. it uh, AK exists. So, what should I do? Remember, this, is, this conversation is happening soon after we talk about linearity property. Brilliant. So you see, one rectangle is at M1, the other height is M2. M1 is on for negative T1 to T1, M2 is on from negative T2 to T2, right? What is the time period for both of them? T. So the time period for both these signals is T, right? So let's do this. Let's try to find out. Uh, x of t, we need to find out a sub k, right? The coefficients of both combined. So let me try, try to do it over here. a sub k equals what? My, what is my standard result? My standard result is this. Right? That is for a pulse train. This is for pulse t1 comma t. Yeah? What do we have over here? x of t is what? Can I say this is m1 multiplied by pulse t1 comma t? Yeah? Plus what? m2 pulse T2 comma T, right? Yeah, nice. That was going to be my next question. I have made an error here, fix it. All right, so that's M2 minus M1, right? Because I'm only looking at this. I'm not looking at the entire one. So for the second one, the scaling is going to be M2 minus M1, pulses T2 and T, yeah? Now I can use the standard. So what is AK going to be? Well, I can't find AK directly. Based on the sequence of steps that I've given you, I need to find out A sub zero first. What is A sub zero? Area divided by time period. So what is area?
two T one M one. What about this guy? M two minus M one. Add it up. What do you get? What is that? So you get two T one M one plus two T two M two minus two T two M one divided by what? Yes. Maybe we can write it in a slightly easier to uh, express. So two T one M one divided by T plus uh, two T two divided by T multiplied by M two minus M one. Just let let us leave it like this, so that you can see them separately. Next, that's A sub zero, right? Area divided time period. Next, let us talk about A sub k. What is A sub k going to be? We are going to do this for the first one, then for the second one, while using linearity. So, what is going to be for the first one? This piece, m1 pulse t1 t. I have m1 multiplied by 2t1, 2t1 m1 divided by cap t sink k. What is omega naught? 2 pi divided by t. Omega naught T1. Guys, agree with that? That's for the first, the, the pink rectangles. Plus, for the second one, what do you have? 2 T2 multiplied by M2 minus M1 divided by T sink K 2 pi over T. T2. Is that okay? Can I say this is for all k? This included. This included. So when I put in a zero here, I get back a sub zero. So this satisfies. So I can say this is for all k. What would be a bad way to solve this problem? Was it? Start from scratch. Start doing the integration and this limit and that limit. Oh, break it that integration. This plus this plus this. Three different integrations. We'll have to deal with an exponential. You will have to substitute limits. And God forbid, if you pick a integration limit which is not even zero to t instead of negative, then you will have to deal with a lot of things. Instead, use this. So you see, this is going to be how the next few weeks shape up. Can I leverage my standard results? Right. All right. I hope this discussion was good. We will meet again on Monday. We will extend this to other Fourier series properties. I'm going to stop recording here.